On this week's Vaticano, Pope Francis announces the canonization of two of his predecessors, one of them without the customary two miracles. At the general audience, the Pope speaks of the holiness of the Church despite its faults. He also celebrates Mass with catechists on pilgrimage to St. Peter's as guardians of the memory of God. And this catechist from Washington, D.C. spoke of beauty as a way to God. The Pope himself invites all catechists to be the strongest witnesses to the faith, and a new book on the founder of an Italian Catholic movement is now presented in Rome. All this plus a look at the Vatican's own police force on their patron saint's feast day coming up. During the last week of September, the Vatican has attracted the attention of world media. The Pope's gathering with eight cardinal advisors has awakened great expectation. These meetings, held from the 1st to the 3rd of October, will result in crucial decisions for the future of the Universal Church. But the news doesn't stop there. During the same days, the decision of a date that the Catholic world had been long awaiting for was finally announced. Former Popes John Paul II and John XXIII will be made saints on the 27th of April of next year, on the Divine Mercy Sunday. Vatican spokesman Father Federico Lombardi explained in a press conference why that date was chosen. Let's remember that also the beatification of John Paul II was celebrated on Divine Mercy Sunday. We find an evident link between these popes and their devotion to Divine Mercy. Moreover, we're talking about a period of the year that is ideal, as it's the first Sunday after Easter, and the pilgrims that will want to come to Rome will have an easier time of it. The decree of the second miracle of Blessed John Paul II was published on the 5th of July, opening up the path towards his canonization according to ordinary procedures. The end of the decree stated that Pope Francis had approved the canonization of Blessed John XXIII without the need of a second miracle. Aside from the exception of this case, there was one other pope that took the same decision a few decades ago. I'll remind you that the dispensation of the second miracle to proceed to the canonization was already done by John XXIII himself for St. Gregory Barbarigo. Hence, we can say that this is an exception that was carried out in recent decades, precisely by John XXIII himself. With this double canonization, Pope Francis hopes to give a sign of hope to the Church and the world through the figures of these two great pontiffs. The canonization of John the 23rd is to be a canonization pro gratia, or by grace, approved by Pope Francis. The fame of the saintliness of Pope Roncalli is well known. Already in the time of the Second Vatican Council and just a day after the death of the good Pope, his sainthood was being discussed. Numerous council fathers publicly proclaimed their collective wish to make John XXIII a saint without the need of approving a miracle as an act of the very council. The Jesuit theologian Father Peter Gumpel has extensively studied the saintly virtue of Catholics gone by. He's turned to even by the popes as an expert on the prodigal. But in this case, Pope Francis' decision trumped all standard procedure. I think it's kind of gesture, it is rather unusual. Unusual in this sense that our present Holy Father, Pope Francis, dispensed from the miracle that is required for the canonization. This has caused a certain amount of bewilderment, in extreme cases even of criticism, and I got many phone calls People say, what do you think about? You are an expert in these matters. I said, look, the requirement of a miracle is not a divine law. There's nothing in scripture with it. It is a ecclesiastical, positive law given by some popes in the past. The pope is above that. And if he decides he should do it, it is right. And it is absolutely out of place to criticize that. He is the head of the church, he is a responsible person, if he wants to do it, fine. 
The last pope to do such a thing, in fact, was John XXIII himself. Thousands gathered on Wednesday morning at St. Peter's Square to hear Pope Francis' weekly teaching on faith. The pontiff explained in his native tongue during the general audience why the church is holy despite its many faults. Dear brothers and sisters, in the creed, after professing that the church is one, we also say she is holy. How is it possible to affirm that the Church is holy if, during the course of history, she's had so many obscure moments? How can she be holy if she is made up of sinners? The Church is holy because God is holy. He is faithful and does not ever abandon her to the power of death or of evil. She is holy because Jesus Christ, God's saint, has indissolubly united himself to her. She is holy because the Holy Spirit purifies her, transforms her, and constantly renews her. She is holy not because of our merits, but because God makes her holy. Let us not be afraid to be saints. We are all called to sainthood, which does not consist of doing extraordinary things, rather of letting God work in our lives with His Spirit, entrusting that His action may lead us to live in charity, to do everything with joy and humility for the greater glory of God and the good of our neighbor. Thanks for watching Vaticano. After the break, we hear from an art historian who is also a catechist. Also, discover the new book on an Italian priest that lived the faith on the streets. Welcome back. This is Vaticano. Pope Francis celebrated Mass with thousands of catechists here in St. Peter's Square on the 29th of September. They made the pilgrimage to Rome as a part of the Year of Faith. During his homily, the Pope asked them to be living examples of faith. Chi è il catechista? È colui che custodisce who are catechists? They are people who keep the memory of God alive. They keep it alive in themselves and they are able to revive it in others. This is something beautiful, to remember God, like the Virgin Mary, who sees God's wondrous works in her life but doesn't think about honor, prestige or wealth. She doesn't become self-absorbed. Instead, after receiving the message of the angel and conceiving the Son of God, what does she do? She sets out. She goes to assist her elderly kinswoman, Elizabeth, who was also pregnant. And also the first thing she does upon meeting Elizabeth is to recall God's work, God's fidelity, in her own life, in the history of her people, in our history. My soul magnifies the Lord, for He has looked on the lowliness of His servant. His mercy is from generation to generation. Mary remembers God. If we don't think about God, everything ends up flat. Everything ends up being about me and my own comfort. Life, the world, other people, all of these become unreal. They no longer matter. Everything boils down to one thing, having. When we no longer remember God, we too become unreal. We too become empty, like the rich man in the gospel. We no longer have a face. Those who run after nothing become nothing. As another great prophet Jeremiah observed, we are made in God's image and likeness, not the image and likeness of material objects, of idols. The Pope didn't just describe the mission of the catechist, he also gave them a few guidelines of how to obtain fruits through their vocations. What must we do in order to not be complacent? People who find their security in themselves and in material things, but men and women of the memory of God? In the second reading, St. Paul, once more writing to Timothy, gives some indications which can also be guideposts for us in our work as catechists. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. 
a la pietà, alla fede, alla carità, alla pazienza, alla mitezza. At the end of the Eucharist and before praying the Angelus, the pontiff asked once again for prayers for peace in Syria and in the entire Middle East. And with a fraternal hug, he greeted the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch and all the East. Patriarch John X. Yazigi is the brother of one of the two kidnapped Orthodox bishops in Syria. Uno de los cinco catequistas que participó en la peregrinación de tres días fue este estadounidense de Washington, D.C. El doctor James Sullivan es un historiador del arte al servicio de la catequesis. Distinct yet inseparable ministries of evangelization and catechesis. These words of Jesus also draw us together as evangelists and catechists in this International Catechetical Congress during this year of faith. I think there's a couple of things we can talk about in terms of even what Pope Francis mentioned to the catechists. And that was, first of all, the integrity of the message of catechesis, that the whole content of the faith, as it's summarized in the catechism of the Catholic Church, is what the catechist has given the responsibility to communicate to others, the whole truth and beauty of the Catholic faith. I think a second point that we, we discussed was the whole idea of really the witness, the personal witness of the catechist. That's so important. You can have great methodologies, you can have great textbooks, but at the end of the day it's really about the personal witness to holiness that the catechist brings to their vocation. Pope Francis reminded the group that uh, being part of the church's catechetical ministry is not a job but a vocation. It's really a call of the Lord asking us to serve him in this way. Um, and then finally, I think one has to look at just the sense of the unity of faith that brought us all together as catechists. Después del doctor Sullivan, los catequistas fueron animados por unas palabras del líder. Después del doctor Sullivan, los Participants of the International Congress of Catechists were treated to a catechesis given by the Pope himself. He thanked their service to the Church and assured them that God is always with them. Il Signore sempre ci primerea. Ormai avete The Lord always comes before us. By now you've learned the meaning of this word. And the Bible says this, not I. The Bible says, the Lord says in the Bible, I am like the flower of the almond tree. Why? Because it is the first flower that blooms in spring. He is always the first. He is first. This is fundamental for us. God always comes before us. When we think of walking away to a far-off periphery, and maybe we are a little scared, in reality, he is already there. Jesus awaits us in the heart of that brother, in his wounded flesh, in his oppressed life, in his faithless soul. But do you know one of the peripheries that hurt me the most, that makes me feel pain? I've seen it in the diocese where I was before. It's that of children who do not know how to make the sign of the cross. This is a periphery. It's necessary to go there. And Jesus is there who awaits you to help that boy make the sign of the cross. He always comes first. Always start afresh from Christ. I say thank you for all that you do, but particularly because you are in the church, in the path of the people of God, because you walk with the people of God. Remain with Christ, abide in Christ. Let us try to always be more and more with Him. Let's follow Him, imitating Him in His movement of love, in His going out to meet man. And let's us go out, open the doors. Let's have the audacity to outline new paths to announce the gospel. A new biography on the founder of the Communion and Liberation Movement, Father Luigi Giussani, is the most comprehensive look yet into his life. 
After his death in 2005, his successor, Father Julian Carron, and other members of the movement have been working on it. It's a biography, but it could have been written by Don Giussani himself. Tiene en muchos aspectos un, un, un carácter casi autobiográfico porque it has in many aspects a character which is almost autobiographical because it is Giussani himself who speaks, who expresses himself, who tells what has happened and who judges that which has happened to him. It means he gives his appreciation to be able to show what he has learned from every life experience. I think that the experience of Giussani is so rich. He had to face so many challenges in life. He lived with so much responsibility. He took so seriously the drama of living that he can offer others what he has learned from life, regardless of who the author is, regardless of the faith he has. It is simply the testimony of a person who took his own life seriously and who tells us what it meant to know Jesus, to be able to find an answer to all of life's challenges. Father Giussani gave up his professorship in the theology department at the University of Milan in Italy in 1954. He started giving religion classes in a local high school. For Father Carron, this decision shows just the essence of this Milanese priest's message. I think the most significant of his life with this gesture, we find a big part of the greatness of Giussani, a big part of the passion to be able to communicate to others what Christianity is. And to do so, he had to reinvent. He had to show, to discover, invent a new way of communicating, appropriate to young people. For example, some remember him strolling on the streets of Milan with a radio cassette under his arm to be able to listen to music with his students, or when he would take works of Leopardi, a very famous Italian poet and writer, to the lessons to read the verses to his students, or when he would teach them how to sing or take them to the most beautiful places in Italy to open their eyes to the beauty of creation. He did all of this to be able to communicate the meaning of the Christian experience, how the Christian experience was capable of awakening all of the heart's requirements taking them seriously and offering a concrete and exhaustive answer to each one of them. With this book, the movement he founded aims to offer one of the most significant figures of the church in recent history for the world's discovery. In a few moments, we will be back with an inside look into the Pope's own private police force. Welcome back, you're watching Vaticano. This is the Vatican's Gendarme Guard. It's the Pope's police service, an often unknown and unseen force with a long history inside the Leonine Walls. The history goes back to even before the Swiss Guard, so a little while ago. In the 15th century, we already had, you could say, an early police force, which was led by Soldanus, who was in charge of providing a little public safety here. And then, of course, under Pope Pius V, we have the famous Siberia. This is a feared police force. The name is still used to this day, I believe, here in Italy, if you want to express something very martial, because you have a very sharp, sometimes even a little brutal, police unit involved. One must remember, of course, the Gendarmerie experienced a change in the year 1870. Until then, it was an official unit of the states, of the churches, and could also be recruited from the Papal States. From 1870 on, they received support from Italian police forces, which were put in place later in the Vatican Security Service. Today, we actually have a very good cooperation with Italy, with the Carabinieri police force, but there are also special forces in the Vatican police. There's an anti-terrorist unit. There's a Gruppo Intervento Rapido, which means quick response unit. And they did their training in Quantico with the FBI in the US. So we have a highly motivated and highly skilled police force now in the Vatican. Police 
Every year, at the end of September, the gendarmes mark their patron St. Michael the Archangel's feast day with a celebration in the Vatican Gardens. The Archangel, like them, is in charge of warding off evil. Pope Francis even took part in their celebration this year. He presided over Mass for them in the Lord's Grotto behind St. Peter's. He told them also to be on guard against the hidden danger of gossip, calling it a war with the tongue. The private Mass is a new initiative this year, but then again the year has been full of novelties for the guardians of the Pope. But it is, of course, when we look at the safety aspect, it is, of course, if you take a look at the security aspect, something new, with the two units that are responsible for security in the Vatican, the Swiss Guard and the Gendarmerie. They must both naturally make some small changes. Pope Francis goes out to people a lot. He sometimes breaks through the barriers, and that is indeed very good for the people who are in St. Peter's Square or for other occasions to meet the Pope. But it is, of course, the worst-case scenario for security forces who can't intervene because they're placed in a difficult position. Sometimes they have to pull him back or they have to ask him to step back a little, not only for his safety, but also for the safety of the people who are around him. His book, The Gendarmes of the Pope in the Fight Against Robbers, Revolutionaries and Vataliks, is now available in German shops. A member of the Pontifical of Life Academy took part in a private audience with the Pope in Rome. At the end of their meeting, Pope Francis blessed a picture of his family. Dr. John Haas was profoundly moved. Well, I must say that one of the most thrilling moments with the Holy Father was when I took out the picture of my family and I held it up to him and said to him in Spanish, because he doesn't speak English, I think everybody knows that, but I held up the picture and said in Spanish, uh, Holy Father, a blessing for my family, please. And so he placed his hand on the photo and stopped and prayed. And I was very touched and moved by that. And um, in fact, when he looked at the picture, when he first looked at the picture, uh, he said, oh, in Spanish, he said, oh, there's so few of, the, of you. But of course, he was being a little sarcastic, you know. <laughs>